Hello and welcome. This is the first in a series of webinars called Starting a Food Co-op, What You Need to Know. Today's session is Developing a Shared Vision and Building Alignment. Bill Gessner will be our presenter today. This series is sponsored by CDS Consulting Co-op and Food Co-op 500. Uh, CDS specializes in support, consulting, training, and development for food co-ops, both existings and startups. We have 89 people who registered for today's session, and over 30 have already signed on. Um, we hope more will be coming along. Uh, we will be having uh, five more workshops in this series. They will be held every two weeks um, from today, same time, uh, same process. If you haven't already registered, you will need to register for each session individually. Um, today's presenter is Bill Gessner, and Bill is the country's leading expert in starting co-ops. He's worked with a variety of uh, co-ops, both um, existing and startups, and provides a wide range of services to those co-ops. So Bill will be presenting today. Before I turn it over to Bill, I want to ask the participants to uh, sign up for a a pin number for an audio pin. You'll do that on the right side of your screen. And when you are effective at doing that, the little telephone next to your name will sign up, will show up green. Um, then, as we go along in the presentation, if you have a question or a comment, please type that in the question box. That's also on the right hand side of your screen. If you type in your question, uh, then I will be moderating the questions and um, bringing those to Bill when he is at a good point for that particular question. So don't worry if your question is going to cover something that's uh, going to come up later in the session. If so, I'll just hold that question until we get to that point. So type in your question, and then uh, when it's time, I'll, I'll click the telephone, and that will give you voice privileges so you can ask your own question and interact with Bill. Um, also present with us today is a, a special guest, Bonnie Hudspeth from the uh, Monadnock Food Co-op, the organizing uh, group that's organizing a co-op in Keene, New Hampshire. And we're very pleased to have Bonnie with us today. So you can address your question to either Bill or Bonnie. Uh, either one will be happy to take your questions. At the end of the seminar, there will be a very brief evaluation form, which is uh, those are very helpful for us in planning the series to make sure that the, the workshops uh, meet your needs. So we hope that you'll take a couple of minutes to answer those few questions that we have at the end. Uh, with that, Bill, I think I'll turn it right on over to you. Thank you, Marilyn. Uh, <clears throat> greetings, fellow cooperators across the country and perhaps internationally. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today and to envision all of you in your respective communities um, who are involved in a project to organize and start up a food co-op in your community. It's been uh, quite remarkable in the, uh, in the last five to seven years, the uh, interest that has, uh, I kind of say that it has spontaneously germinated around the country in a rather organic fashion. Uh, but there's quite a, a, a large interest in starting up food co-ops, and it's a new round of food co-ops following the round that was started 30 plus years ago. And uh, even though um, you know the natural foods industry is a lot more evolved than it was, uh, and the products are available in many conventional uh, markets, there still seems to be a desire by many communities to have a food co-op. And so we're very glad that you're taking time to be with us here today. Um, the agenda that we have uh, for today is roughly sketched out here. Uh, the first uh, 20 minutes or so, uh, I'll take some time and I'll invite our guest, Bonnie, to comment a little bit as well. But we'll just kind of walk through some slides that we have here and talk about the concept of shared vision and building a shared vision and building alignment within your cooperative. And then the uh, last, uh, at least the last half hour, uh, we'll, and perhaps a little longer, we'll have time for discussion and questions. And then we will have a little wrap up at the very end. So in terms of our outcomes, desired outcomes for today, 
uh, it is kind of a visualizing process, and we're being challenged to do that as we're all in many different places here. But uh, I'm hoping that as we go through the hour here today that uh, you will be uh, further developing what your vision and your specific visual uh, image of what your co-op might look like and be like uh, 10 years from now. And, uh, and that you gain an understanding of the process of building a shared vision and building alignment within, within your uh, leadership group of your co-op and what that might mean. And also, how do you continue to uh, build that vision and alignment as you build your as you build your membership base? And then, lastly, how can you sustain frequent and broad communication of vision with all of the stakeholders that you draw into uh, as you organize your cooperative and as you open your cooperative? The idea of bringing in stakeholders, people in organizations who are invested in your success. And so the challenge is um, building a, a common and a shared vision that brings people together and inspires people. Uh, if we, I, I assume that many of you have uh, some familiarity with a development model that has um, been put forth as part of the Food Co-op 500 uh, organization, and it's available on the Food Co-op 500 website. And to visualize this model, we have a little drawing here today, the four cornerstones and three stages. And the idea is that throughout the whole process and organizing and, and maturing of your food co-op, that you need to focus on developing strength and capacity in four cornerstones to kind of provide a, a foundation and a base for your co-op. Those four cornerstones are pictured here in terms of uh, vision and talent and capital and systems. And initially, it might be hard to relate to what those cornerstones represent, but if you stay focused on this model and keep working with it, you, you gain uh, a greater awareness of what is involved in each of those four cornerstones. And the four cornerstones in three stages, the second part of this is the three basic stages of organizing, of creating a food co-op, stage one being organizing it, stage two being a feasibility and planning stage. There are actually two sub-stages there, sub-stage 2A feasibility and 2B planning, and then the implementation stage. And that, as we'll see, has four sub-stages. But uh, this is a visual image for you to, to, to look at. Um, in terms of looking at these three stages in, a, in another fashion, and this um, slide is, I've used in other webinars, but I'll just go through it very quickly. Um, the three stages laid out with their sub-stages. And the dotted line represents when you would secure a site. And you would secure a site with a lease agreement or a purchase agreement with contingencies, uh, the primary contingency being contingent upon getting all of your financing in place. Once you secure a site at the end of stage 2B, you would go public with being able to announce that site. And then you have a period of time to get all your financing in place during stage 3A as you're also finalizing your design work. And at the end of stage 3A is the solid line. And that represents the final decision point once you cross over that line, there's no turning back. Um, that's when you're, that's the, the go, no go decision point. So throughout the three stages, you will be going through a process of taking a, a vision, which might be one person or a small group of people's individual visions, and bringing them together to form a shared vision for what your co-op will be. And that vision that you have in the organizing stage may be 
one thing, and as you proceed through the stages, your vision will change and grow, and you will be tested. Your vision will be tested. Uh, is it realistic? Is it feasible? Can you? Is it practical? Is it achievable? Can you make? Is this vision that you're that you're entertaining and aspiring towards? Is that something that you can actually make happen? And so, you're. As you work through the, the stages, you are certainly are tested because this is a challenging process, as many of you know. And um, your individual project will do all. It, I like to say that your individual project will do all it can to resist this template. Uh, you may start out with a site and think, "Okay, we, we've got our site in place. Let's open our doors." And you may have skipped some of the necessary steps uh, prior to that. And uh, so I encourage you to use the discipline and to take this template and practice and put your project in, into this template. Uh, some other ways of viewing the, the stages are shown here. Um, we won't go through this in detail as these have been covered in other webinars, but these slides are available uh, for you. Um, but it kind of describes briefly what is involved in each step. And another way of looking at it is, you know, assuming that you would have so many members at each stage along the way, this uh, scenario assumes a store of 6,000 square feet with roughly 4,000 square feet of retail space, um, saying that by the end of stage one that you should have 300 members, and that by the time you open that you would have a thousand members at the end of stage 3C. So the vision that we're talking about, this first cornerstone, uh, can be described in a few ways as shown on this slide. Uh, the vision is the articulation of the hopes and dreams of a founding group. Uh, it is both broad and long-term and inspiring, but also specific and local. Uh, it's something that you, as you communicate it to a group of people, that you want to have something visual attached to it. Um, the, the vision is refined and developed as the merging co-op moves through the development stages. In other words, it'll change. and. Um, as you learn. And so developing a learning culture in your organization where you're open to doing research and learning and coming together and having discussion and dialogue amongst your leadership group, that is, that's basically how a shared vision evolves over time. The also included in the in the vision for your co-op is some envisioning of the process of developing a food co-op. So you're not just envisioning what the store is going to look like, but how are you going to get there? You know, what is the process going to be? And food co-ops are um, being democratically controlled organizations have uh, you know, definitely have a process that is special and that needs to be honored through the through the developmental process. So, some key ingredients um, to building a shared vision over time. Some of these I've mentioned here, but visual um, education that that. Again, a learning you have a, that you're that you that you're modeling a learning environment in your in your co-op and in your organizing group. You're not coming together in a in a fashion that is rigid or pretending to know all the answers or attached to one specific um, vision, but that you're open to doing research on what is going to be appropriate and what will best serve your community and the members of your food co-op that uh, there's certainly a stretching process involved 
in the visioning because as you encounter the reality of trying to create a food co-op in your community and you begin to see what the cost of it might be and how much time is involved uh, with it, um, your initial vision is going to, you're going to need to do, do some stretching. And it's very helpful to have in mind models as you're trying to organize your food co-op. What is the model that your group is aspiring towards? Are there other food co-ops? Is there one particular food co-op that you're familiar with, whether it be a neighboring food co-op or food co-op that you visited in other parts of the country? Or are there, it may not even be a, a co-op. It may be another business or another natural foods grocery store or it may be even another type of business organization that you see aspects of that you wish to model and bring into your organization. Um, as I work with groups around the country, I find that those who have a model and have a reference point um, are much further along than, than those who have had very little contact with or experience with both other food co-ops or other models. So thinking in terms of a container, what is, what is the container that's going to hold your shared vision? Uh, again, that's not just the, the store, but the, the cooperative itself will become a container. And the process involved in creating that co-op. So thinking of in, a, in a broad way, you know, what's going to contain your vision? What is the process for building a shared vision? And using dialogue and discussion, are you building agreement over time? Or are you stumbling you know, and tripping and having miscommunication or dysfunctional communication along the process? So these are this kind of a checklist to look at and come back to from time to time as, you, as you're building your shared vision. Okay, yeah. Bill. Yes. I wonder, uh, there's a couple of questions that are coming in now that, that kind of relate to where you are now. Would you be open to taking those at this point? Uh, yes, and I want to I get to uh, having Bonnie uh, describe her situation a little bit and, uh, with, with the co-op that she's involved with. And, um, and, you know, maybe we could even start there and then take a question. Sounds good. Bonnie? Yeah, sure. Yeah, if you could just uh, give us a little bit of background of, of your of your group. Sure. Um, our group is from Keene, New Hampshire, and we first started organizing in April 2008. And um, we started a feasibility study with Cooperative Development Services in June 2009. And we have about 15 people that have been meeting regularly over time and a steering committee. Um, and we're we're at the stage of we've done a market feasibility study. We are um, finishing up the first draft of our bylaws and looking forward to forming our board of directors and incorporating very soon. And you've, you've also done a financial performa, I think? Yes, we have the first draft of our financial performa as well. Yeah. And um, good. So uh, at this point, you're still, what stage are you in in the... Uh, in the, in the process, or would you, how would you define that? Well, it's funny because we're in the organi we're we're finishing up the organizing phase, yet at the same time we've already completed part of the feasibility stage in 2A. Right, and so one of the things that as we've talked, it's it's been kind of important to identify the things that that that, it, that you're really still in stage one officially, uh, and and that you have a like a checklist of things that you're trying to create. You know, to, to be able to check off that would say that you have officially completed the organizing stage, even though that you've, you know, done some of the feasibility work. So there's, there's kind of that challenge of saying, you know, saying where are you in this, in this timeline and what are the remaining things that you need to do to advance to the next stage. Right, and I think about two months ago we really worked with Bill on the timeline and refreshing, okay, now we've done all these fundamental steps. Let's go back, let's look at where we are in the timeline. 
what do we need to get done ASAP? And that really, it brought to mind again the fact that we had not completed the phases of the organize, or the different steps of the organizing phase and how crucial that would be before we could even think of moving on um, to the next phase. Okay, thank you. Uh, Marilyn, you had some questions? Yeah, there's a question from Dean, and Dean, I've unmuted you so you can ask your question. It relates to this uh, staging. Thanks. Uh, we're a, a very initial uh, startup here in the Fargo-Moorhead area, uh, Fargo, North Dakota, Moorhead, Minnesota, and uh, we're looking at trying to get grant money to conduct a feasibility study, and yet we have not uh, established a, a membership drive and and don't have you know any per se members we've got 1300 odd people on Facebook that are very interested in this process there's a Facebook page for the co-op but I guess my question is when does the organizing become the membership drive so we can have members who have committed to a certain dollar amount so we can take that information to uh, there's a granting agency in North Dakota that would, would probably rely heavily on, on the number of members we've signed up to give us a grant to conduct a feasibility study. Right. Well, that's a, that's a good question, and certainly I think all groups kind of run into that, uh, you know, which comes first, and how do you proceed if you don't, you know, with, how do you establish some initial funding base? Um, we recommend that early, very early on in the organizing stage that you incorporate and that that and there is a legal primer uh, th available through the Food Co-op 500 website that gives some guidance to that, and that you can then set up a, an account, and that you can even that you can begin uh, once you've incorporated and once you've um, defined what is your member share requirement for your members, and take some work to do that. You don't just quickly do that, but it, you may I would do some research, and you know I think we can. I would I would involve a, a consultant or something like that to help you <coughs> design a a membership, a member equity structure, mm -hmm. and then that you can begin a member organizing drive, uh, a membership drive, early in the organizing phase. And so if you can begin to show progress and show some momentum, uh, you know it's great that you have the. 1,300 people showing interest on Facebook, but if you can begin to get those to be members, uh, that really brings fuel into the organization. Mm -hmm. And uh, trying to be reliant upon grant funding is can be a trap. Uh, some startup groups have had some success with it. Uh, I don't think there are any magic answers there, um, but uh, so my advice is focus on on getting incorporated, focus on designing a uh, an appropriate member equity structure. Um, an alternative to that might be that if there's a small leadership group that would be willing to um, put some money in on a on a loan basis to the organization to begin with, um, that some groups have used that to help get them started when they didn't have any funding at all. Uh, or some groups have done fundraisers, you know, um, you know, although there's a lot of work and a lot of energy that goes into, into yeah. doing so Those are some other approaches, but, uh, you know, we'd be glad to talk with you more specifically about it. All right, thanks. Well, there's another question from um, Lynn uh, Taylor on an initial uh, a related line of questions. And then after uh, after Lynn's questions, I think uh, we'll let you get back to your presentation and, and uh, bring the rest in later. Uh, Lynn, tell us where you're from. Um, I'm calling from Concordia, Ontario. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. Um, I'm calling from Concordia, Ontario, and I'm I'm not actually involved in a co-op, but I am um, a student of the Sustainable Local Foods for All Canadians program at St. Lawrence College in Kingston, and. Um, we are currently studying cooperatives, and I'm 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 puzzled by uh, the balance between membership and and member share cost, and um, just if there is a point at which um, selling shares to potential co-op members becomes a real challenge when it comes to 
um, food co-ops specifically. Um, and and I, the question comes because I'm aware of um, a food co-op in Ontario that uh, was struck um, selling shares at about $1,000. And um, it was it, it's become a real challenge for them because in their bylaws they were allowing 50% of of their um, their sales to go to non-co-op members, and it, it's become a real challenge because people are looking at the thousand dollars and saying, "Well, I'll just I'll just shop as a non a non um, owning uh, participant." So I, I'm wondering whether there's some some magical number <laughs> out there that uh, once you're over that, it becomes a real challenge. Well, I, I don't think there is a, a magical number. Uh, I, I think in designing a membership program for your food co-op, you need to take a lot of things into consideration, uh, and to, including the long-term capital needs of the of the organization and how much of that. Of those, of that capital do you ultimately want to have come from your, from your member owner base, uh, okay. and that can range quite a bit in different situations. Uh, many co-ops look at as they are trying to determine their member share requirement, their member equity investment, and they ask the question, "What can we get away with?" And that's not really the best question. Uh, if if you were going to ask your members to vote on what they wanted to, your potential members to vote on what they would want the equity requirement to be, they might say five dollars, but uh, the needs might be much greater. Um, and, and so, I, I hesitate to, to say any type of formula to, you know, a quick and easy formula to to determine what your member share requirement is. But it seems that. You know, the two hundred dollars is a is a common number for many of the food co-ops in the in the United States um, that they're looking at that, and some of them are offering payment plans on that, and you know, some flexibility around that. Um, there there are even you know there can be some legal issues related to designing your member sh membership program, and as, as to how it interrelates with your bylaws and your articles of incorporation, and so. All of that needs to be considered as well. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, I want to move along a little bit here into um, uh, we talked through these key ingredients, and I, I want to kind of illustrate a, what I see in a lot of situations, um, and I kind of call it from 20 percent to 80 percent, and. If you think of your group that you're working with that is trying to organize a co-op in your community, and let's say you have, like Bonnie is saying, maybe 15, 15 people or 15 to 20 people kind of active as a, as a core group or a leadership group or a founding team, um, each of those participants will have their own individual visions of what a, what a food co-op is and what their food co-op is going to be in the future. And it's quite amazing when you begin to really look at those individual specific visions and to see how much of those individual visions are shared and how much of those individual visions are different from one another. And usually at the beginning part of the process, maybe 20% of the individual visions are shared. And uh, yet the group might think that they're all on the same page. And uh, typically, that is typically they're not on the same page, even despite even if they <laughs> think they are initially. And so, even doing some kind of an exercise that that has people write out their specific visual image of what the co-op is going to look like ten years from now or be like, and to say, and then to kind of share those writings with the others in the group and have some discussion on what are the points of agreement and what are the points of disagreement, and to certainly honor points of disagreement, but to, to use those as an opportunity to discuss and say, how can we find a, a common vision, a shared vision that we can build from? 
and so that over time, over a period of, as Bonnie is saying, from her group starting in April 2008, so well over a year and a half into the process at this point, you know, my observation of their group is that they have been building a shared vision slowly but surely since they started. And, you know, whether it's approaching or exceeding 80% at this time, I don't know, but my, my guess is that it is. And uh, that's, you know, a way that I've found to work with groups to help them think of what point they are at with, with the process of building a shared vision. And, and then, important, you know, as you're going down this path of organizing the, the co-op and beginning to move into a feasibility stage where that vision is going to be tested. And feasibility, the way I recommend that feasibility be approached, it's not just simply a matter of doing a feasibility study, pushing a button and getting an answer, but it's a matter of looking at feasibility in four separate areas. Uh, from a market feasibility point of view, is your proposed food co-op feasible? From a financial feasibility point of view, is your proposed co-op feasible? From an internal readiness and a capacity point of view, will you be able to operate a food co-op? And from a design point of view, is the specific location that you're looking at appropriate for housing, you know, a grocery store of the type that you're envisioning. <clears throat> and those are four somewhat separate um, windows to look at the question of feasibility. Uh, you might find that a market feasibility says, yes, there's a strong market here. It's underserved. It has the, you know, the potential to have $4 million worth of sales for a store that is you know, 6,000 square feet of retail space. And, but that assess, so that might be a favorable assessment from a market point of view, but that doesn't tell you anything about whether it's going to be financially feasible. And it doesn't tell you anything about the organization's capacity to operate a store of that size and attract and serve those sales. And so feasibility is a process it goes on during stage 2A and 2B as you move into the planning or the business planning stage where you continue to explore and look at these areas of feasibility. And if, you're ready, if, you're, if you come in kind of low in one of these areas, what are the things you need to do to address the, the weak elements in your plan and work on that over time? So concurrent with building a shared vision, you're also trying to assess whether your vision is feasible or not. And there can be tension between those two, and it can be a healthy tension. Uh, but that you, at the end of the process, your shared vision should be stronger than at the beginning. Uh, Bonnie, would you like to comment uh, just a little bit on, perhaps on how your group has evolved in terms of <clears throat> their their vision from from when you first started till now? Absolutely. Um, I think at the beginning what happens is exactly what you're saying. There are a bunch of folks sitting around a table, all of them feeling like they would be they could be the general managers, knowing exactly how things are going to look and exactly what they want to be in the store. And quickly that starts to kind of melt away. And I think part of what helps that is um, building relationships within the group. And from the very first meeting, I know it sounds kind of cheesy, but at the beginning of each group we have an introduction type of icebreaker to really get to know each other and build relationships and understand each other's personalities and where we're coming from. And I imagine with most food co-ops, there's a lot of different people sitting at the table with different skill sets, whether they be accounting or working in a nonprofit. And I think what's been really essential is beyond doing a lot of co -op, educating ourselves about co-ops is working on building our own relationships so that we're functional as a group 
and so that even if you're not on the same page, you, you tend to maybe be able to compromise your vision a little bit. And I think that's been incredibly helpful. Um, and I also, I can't overstate the importance of working with other cooperatives in the area because it really helps to give a vision of what we could look like 10 years down the road. And, um, and also, I don't know if anyone else out there feels this way, but in our community, in, in New Hampshire, in fact, there are a lot less food cooperatives than in other New England states surrounding us. And that's changing, excitingly. But um, none of us feel like the experts. And that's really challenging moving forward. And I think being able to talk to Cooperative Development Institute and Cooperative Development Services over time has really helped to build up our confidence level to at least have someone that's been in this experience for over 20 years, I think, for most of the folks at the table, and to be able to give feedback and be like, you're not crazy. This is very, this is the right, you're on the right track. So that's been really helpful. So as you've been building your vision and your shared vision, part of the, uh, part of the process is bringing your group of people together, having them get acquainted with one another, but, and also, you know, how do you attract that group of people and what assortment of talents and, and skills and interests, you know, have you brought together as a group? Uh, you know, that's been, uh, to me, that's been impressive with your group and also that you have involved others from outside of your community in this process and uh, so that you're, again, it's the idea of involving people, other groups who are stake, can become, will become stakeholders in your success and, uh, and that's a, a real key to the organizing process. Uh, um, Bill and Bonnie, there's a question that's come in around the kinds of issues that get worked out in this stage between the 80, when you're moving from um, 20 to 80. And yep. I wonder if either of you might address that question. Okay. Oh, uh, you asked, okay, that's the question? The, the kind of issues uh, that, that, that come up. Uh, well, I think there's, um, there are issues related to what is the, you know, is, is the food co-op going to be able to offer the lowest possible price for food for its members, or is it going to, you know, provide a, a level of, you know, quality, high quality natural foods, for example, or all organic foods. Uh, and so there can be some uh, tension between that type of, that kind of an issue. Uh, what is the role of volunteers or working members in your co-op to be? Uh, certainly volunteerism is important during the organizing stage, but most of the food co-ops, established food co-ops in the country today have either eliminated their volunteer or their working member programs or they're much smaller than they were um, 10 or 15 or 20 years ago. Uh, some people have the vision that volunteering at their co-op is, is an important co-op principle. And it is really, when you look at the list of the seven international co-op principles, it is not really um, one of the co-op principles. Um, so those are some examples, um, and just other examples relate to the size of store. Uh, I work with a lot of groups that have done maybe an initial plan, initial business plan that kind of details all that they want to offer and the services they want to offer to their members, both in terms of products and services, and they want to do it in a space that is really too small to do that. So that has to get sorted out in the feasibility and planning stage and getting everybody on the same page together, we, you know, what size of store and what are the services that will be offered. So those are some things. Bonnie, do you have a, anything that you'd like to add that's been specific to your group? Um, I think when you're sitting at the table as a group of 14, 15 volunteers and you're trying to think about all of your members to be, and all the community members and all the people that might be members, it can be very overwhelming and thinking about what stakeholder you're serving. And that's kind of the vision. Um, to give an example from our group, at the beginning, 
we were very concerned about the local farmers market because some of the farmers had expressed concern that the food co-op would take away their business. So we spent so much time and effort um, meeting with them, trying to, to, trying to work something out, until we finally came to the realization from both their perspective and ours, it doesn't even make sense to be starting this conversation now in the stage of development that we're at. And um, it helped. They became much more supportive and open. Um, and we finally took a step back and realized, as a group of individuals, we have to empower ourselves to um, and trust ourselves to make decisions as we move forward. Otherwise, we're never going to move forward. And I think that there was about four months of stagnation there related around some of these issues. And once we had figured that out, I think it helped us move along much more quickly, realizing all the stakeholders out there are very important, but we can't just trying to serve each one as an individual um, becomes overwhelming and steers us off track and makes makes you realize how easily it can starting a co-op in two years can stretch to starting a co-op in a decade. So that was a good learning experience. That's a great example. Thank you. So, so again, uh, as we're working from 20% to 80%, building a shared vision, uh, testing that vision through the feasibility stage and into the business planning stage, and uh, that initially, uh, you see at the bottom of the slide, you you begin to you have a vision that you might want to translate into what you might call what is the concept for your food co-op, and you might test yourselves by trying to write that down into a one or two page document that could be revised and refined, and basically getting people on the same page in terms of what is your what is your intent, what is your concept, and then that concept. Uh, will essentially become the core of a business plan. So you can see how you go from building a shared vision into a concept, into a business plan. And and I see some groups also kind of getting tripped up. And, and Bonnie's example is, is a little bit of an, uh, uh, an illustration of that. But I think it's really important to build your shared vision from the inside out. In other words, getting strong at the core, uh, that you're the leadership group that comes together to form your co-op uh, needs to have a common and shared vision amongst itself before you try to um, reach out to your, uh, to your broader membership base. And once you do get, uh, once you're stronger, strong at the core, then you're in a position to extend your vision out. So, so that's what th this slide is referring to in terms of building a shared vision inside and out. Um, I want to move on to talking a little bit about alignment, but I wonder, if, Marilyn, if there are any other questions first. Uh, yes, there is a question here uh, from um, Lena. And I'll unmute you, Lena, and you can ask your question. Hello. Oh, hello. Yes. Um, hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes we can, can. Lena. So, Tell us Sorry, I had you on speakerphone. I, was, I didn't realize I was going to um, actually talk. That's fine. Um, yeah, we, I was just looking at the, um, you know, the list of, um, of stages, and we're sort of kind of similar to where um, the Keen group is, sort of still in organizing, but also wrapping up feasibility. Um, the feasibility stage. With, um, what group are you with? I'm the Kensington Community Food Co-op in um, in Philadelphia. Okay. Um, and we've been working closely with the Weaver's Way Food Co-op. Mm -hmm. And um, and when I saw the three uh, the 300 member the the goal for 300 members, I, I have a question about that. We we had a, a very small initial uh, membership campaign, and we have 34 invested members, but that's obviously a lot farther away than 300. Should we be Focusing once the feasibility study is done, should we focus on getting those th at least 300 members before we move into the planning with the business plan um, stage? Because we're so we're so far behind that having mm -hmm. 300 members. Yeah, I, I would say that would be a, a, a important priority to focus on and to to get to you know to get up to the 450 or 500 member level as you're you know as you're going into the business planning stage. 
uh, depending again on the size of store that you're looking at, but it's hard to envision you know a co-op being able to be successful without you know at least 800 to 1,000 members at, at opening. Um, in in most cases, I'm sure there can be exceptions, but yeah, I would it's, it's just very helpful. I mean, we knew we needed a lot more members. We just I didn't really have a concept of that we should we should be building it over time. Yeah. You know, so so yeah. that's um, great. You could you could easily double the number of members that are listed on this uh, okay. on this slide, and 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 uh, that would be a great advantage to you. Uh, the energy and the momentum that comes from getting people on board and even investing their member share there. And if you're looking towards member loans, uh, you need to have a certain base of members, you know, uh, right. 300 to 400 members before you can really do a member loan drive of significance. Right, right, great. That was, that's this is very helpful. Thank you. Okay. So uh, talk a little bit about alignment here, and sometimes that's... Uh, um, the uh, the way to I think to begin looking at how alignment is happening in your organization is as you as you begin to develop roles in the organization uh, as roles begin to develop including the board of directors and the different work groups or if you have a coordinator or a project manager uh, the key to organizational development is how successful can you be in role development you know within your organization. And then what type of alignment exists between those different roles? You know, is there a board of directors? And is there alignment within the board? And are there work groups that are aligned with the board of directors? Um, you know, alignment, uh, definition of it, um, being an arrangement or position in a straight line or parallel lines, the process of adjusting parts so that they're in proper relative position. Uh, so being aware of this and aspiring towards being in alignment within your organization, being focused on the same common shared vision or goal is, is important. And if you're finding that you're not there, uh, you need to kind of stop and do a self-assessment and it's not necessarily pointing fingers, or it's not um, not you know honoring different points of view, but it is taking time to work through the process to to get on the same page and in in a respectful manner. So again, these are some of the examples here uh, of the way alignment can evolve and as your organization will grow and as you bring management into into play and as the management is accountable to the board of directors, you know, is there alignment between board and management? And I find that if groups that are lacking alignment early on in their organizing stages, that lack of alignment will carry through even if they manage to get the store open and there will be some ineffective and dysfunctional goings on taking place. Bonnie, do you have any comments on, on the concept of alignment within your organization? I think um, co educating people around the table about what a cooperative is was the first challenge for us. So every, at part of every two-hour meeting, we're now meeting monthly, but we have subcommittees that do task force work, a governance committee, a fundraising committee, and a marketing communications committee. But at the main meetings, what we've been doing is the beginning of each meeting after the introductory kind of warm-up game, we've been having um, anywhere from five to 20 minutes of co-op education time and do, really doing the education part. And so if we are having troubles or issues with board development, then we'll get uh, resources off of, off of Co-op 500 website or um, that we've gotten from past webinars and hand them out to everyone, have everyone read them over. And once there's more of an across-the-board understanding of maybe what the issue is or the goal of what we're working towards, it's much easier um, for folks to get on the same page. Great. Thank you. Yes. 
So some uh, tools for building a, a shared vision and alignment throughout the co-op, once you have achieved that at the, at the leadership level or at your core group, uh, here are a list of, um, of tools that can be used. Uh, these same tools can be used to communicate a vision that isn't shared and can also communicate a lack of alignment within the co-op. So <laughs> I really suggest that you really get your vision strong and alignment strong at the core before you begin using these type of tools. Um, you know, the tools range from, uh, uh, you know, newsletters to your website to informational meetings to, you know, but, you know, being clear about your message, you know, what is, what are the messages that you're trying to convey and what are they, how are they prioritized and how are they focused. Uh, and then second, lastly here, there is kind of a list of how do you build a shared vision and alignment with all of your stakeholders and who are those stakeholders. And so here is a list, a uh, partial list of, of what we might call stakeholders that will be invested in your success. Uh, members and potential members, the food co-op community, you know, other co-ops, your own uh, you know, community groups that you have shared vision, shared values with, uh, government, you know, professional consultants, getting people on your team and having your team be a broad, very broad group. And lastly, I, I've also, there's a little bit of discussion about empowerment and food co-ops. And when you begin looking at different roles and alignment and, you know, how do you bring everybody together, that there is a natural empowerment stream that happens within a, within a food co-op where the membership, which is the ownership, elects the board. The board is concerned with governance. The board hires management that is concerned with performance. Management will hire staff that's focused on service. The staff provides service to the customers who are the members and the potential members. And that spills out into the community to result in environment and quality of life and it all circles around back through the membership base. So there is an act of empowering that happens, um, you know, with a, if you have a common shared vision and with alignment in the organization. So, you know, all of this kind of points towards energy and bringing positive energy to your organizing process. Um, Marilyn, I want to ask if we can take some other questions here in our remaining seven or eight minutes. Yes, sure. Um, Bob Noble has a question for Bonnie, and I've unmuted Bob. You can ask that question. Hi, Bonnie. Hi. All right, so uh, I was just curious about uh, y your particular membership base. I'm sorry if I missed what you said. It. I heard you say about 15 board members, but in terms of uh, the broader community, have you already started signing people up or some portion of their equity investment, and how big are you right now, and do you have a specific goal and how much you've, money you've been able to raise so far? Um, I, maybe you already emailed me this question, but um, we have not started our membership drive yet, so we have zero official members at this point. But what we've been doing um, to fundraise, I think Dean was asking this question, we started, I started um, this as a master's project actually like four years ago looking to get a local food cooperative here and um, what I started doing was researching grants and I spent a lot of time doing that and then I realized with advice from other folks that it works better, um, it might work better for feasibility study to look locally. So we spent almost a year fundraising for the feasibility study but at the same time we were building up support and so we, we actually got funds from five different sources, three um, private foundations within the community, the city council itself, and then um, educate local graduate school, Antioch University of New England, that's also located in Keene. And even though it took a little bit more time, it was very helpful because that meant five major presentations in the community describing what a co-op is, what our vision is, 
responding to surveys that had happened in the communities, and one of the top um, visions coming out of the ma city's master plan was the desire for a local walkable market. Um, so that kind of addresses the question of where we get the funds from in the beginning, but um, right now we're about to launch our membership drive, so we're working rapidly um, to, to launch that. But we have had a number in the surveys we've been sending out over the past almost two years, one of the questions on every survey is, would you be a potential member of the food co-op? And we've had over 300 people that have answered this, that they would be a potential member. So of course, that might not translate to that exact number, but we, we're trying to gain some sense of, if we were to start the membership drive today, how many folks could we get? Right. So that's one of the items you have left on your checklist for stage one, is that correct? Yes, that is. So good, okay. So again, in this process, it's so easy to get going in different directions, and if you if you go back to the roadmap and use some discipline, take your project, and as, as much as it might resist the roadmap, uh, you know, put it into the, into the three stages model and, you know, self-assess where you're at and what you need to do to move on to the next stage. And, we, you know, we can certainly work with you and there are others, other people in, that are going through the same process that can work with you and provide support. Is there one more question briefly? Uh, Bill, I think we've taken most of the questions uh, that we, we could answer today. Many of the questions were referring to topics that are going to come up later in the series. So I wonder if you might want to show the other um, topics that we're going to be focused on in, in future questions, in future series, and then I think you would uh, be able to uh, just make some closing comments here. Yes, thank you. Yeah, so here is the uh, list of future webinars uh, starting uh, two weeks from today, uh, Capitalizing Your Co-op. Uh, Tammy Bowers and myself will be presenting that. Uh, Choosing a location, Debbie Swasuna, our market analyst, uh, will be conducting that webinar. Uh, I will be back again at the end of March, developing and managing a timeline. Uh, PJ Hoffman talking about preliminary store design. And Carolee Coulter and myself will talk about hiring and guiding a project manager and or a general manager. So those are what are scheduled. Uh, Marilyn, you can talk about, uh, if you can, just for a moment about how people can access the information from this webinar and, and future webinars, even if they're not able to attend. Yes, absolutely. Uh, you can go to our website, cdsconsulting.coop, and on the left-hand uh, toolbar, there's news and events, and that's where you'll find any classes or webinars that we're doing, uh, click on the one called Starting a Food Co-op, What You Need to Know, and there will be a, a link there. There is a link there for today's session, and after each session there will be another, uh, links will be added after each section. Just click on that link and that will take you to the site where there's a recording and all the, the materials, the, the PowerPoint presentation and any other materials that might be included in any of the workshops. So the starting point is cdsconsulting.coop. That uh, website is showing on the screen here at the bottom of the screen right now. Um, so, and um, again, coming back just in, in summary, you know, as you've gone through this hour, what will your co-op look like in 10 years? Uh, I hope that's shifted a little bit. And the idea of building shared vision and alignment in your leadership group how might you extend that to your membership base and continue it on to building a shared vision with all of your stakeholders uh, and using the, the development model of four cornerstones and three stages. So I want to thank uh, Bonnie Hudspeth from Monadnock Community Market in Keene, New Hampshire. Um, if any of you somehow need contact information for Bonnie and can't find that, uh, please email me and I'll put you in contact with her. And uh, thank you, Marilyn, and thank you, Joel, for your work in the background there. And I think we're done or almost done for the day. Marilyn. Yeah, I think we can sign off. There's uh, been one uh, comment come in specifically, Bill, thanking you for 
your uh, expertise and your leadership here today, so thank you. Um, we hope that all of you have had an enjoyable session and will join us again in two weeks. If you haven't registered, uh, be sure and register. You do need to register either to attend or to download the materials. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bonnie. And we'll see you in two weeks. Okay. Bye, everyone. Yep.